and I see it. Really bad. Okay, so today we're going to continue on talking about the electrical activity of the heart. Uh, but before we do that, just a couple announcements. Some of you will have heard me say some of these things in lab or not, but um, I did get confirmation from your phys instructors that the phys quiz five will be put online. Um, so for the phys lab stuff, you're gonna be doing that on Brightspace. And I believe they told me that the deadline for your final phys quiz will be December 16th. So that's gonna be like the week of the practical. Um, so at the end of that, that'll be your final quiz. So I will see all of you next week for review for anatomy. So I'll see all of you taking that lower limb quiz and then we'll do the review for the practical. Um, so all of you come in there next time. And I'll send out an email double checking that with them and confirming that, but but that's what's up with that. Second is, I know we're all kind of burned out and the internet is also kind of burned out on campus as far as I can tell. Uh, so we're just not gonna do a quiz on this stuff this weekend, spend that time studying for uh, your anatomy quiz, your practical, or like go outside and breathe and get some sunshine. Uh, we'll make the points up at, at some point before the end of the semester so that you have those in for your grade, but don't don't worry about doing that this weekend. Okay. Questions about like general stuff like that. Is the final phase quiz just on the last lab? Yeah, or there's no like final purpose okay. just for anatomy. Yeah. For the phys stuff, yeah. I think that's going to be on your own time, but I'm not involved in phys lab, so that's something to double check with your instructors. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, so electrical activity. We're talking about cells with electrical potential in the heart, which we now know is a muscle, cardiac muscle. Okay. So we have our pacemaker cells and we have our conduction fibers. Okay, so when we talk about these, we got our little heart, All right? We're trying to make our heart squeeze in a specific order. We're going to be trying to squeeze the atria at the top, atria. And then we're gonna be trying to squeeze the ventricles to send out blood to the lungs and to the body, okay? So that's kind of why we need this whole conduction system is to make sure that this happens in that order. So the location of the cells in our electrical pathways are kind of gonna match. So we're going to have a sinoatrial node, the pacemaker of the heart. It's gonna be up in the atria, specifically in the right atrium. And we'll see a picture of this in a second. It's gonna have the fastest pace and kind of control all these others. But we're gonna have a backup, the AV node, the atrioventricular node down on the border with our ventricles. And then we're gonna have conduction fibers connecting all of these and then looping back around. So there are gonna be three types our internodal pathways, our bundle of Hiss, and our Purkinje fibers. So we're gonna take a look at those. Uh, so just a note right now, when I said that the SA node, the sinoatrial node controls the heartbeat, that's because while all these cells do have this property of autorhythmicity, so they can all just like in a Petri dish kind of create their own pace. If you compare the numbers, the SA node goes the fastest, right? So this is kind of like if you're jumping on a trampoline, right? And someone else is jumping at a different speed than you, they mess up your bounce, right? That's what's happening with the SA node. The SA node is firing the fastest. So if the SA node is working, it's going to override all these slower uh, action potentials, essentially, kind of kind of jumpstart them. But if the SA node fails, these will take over a little bit. So your conduction impulse, the start of the action potential is going to be coming from these autorhythmic cells in the conduction system. So that electricity in the heart, and then that action potential is going to go out to the heart muscle itself. 
through gap junctions. So gap junctions are just like doors or windows between two neighboring cells. We've talked about them before because we know ions can just kind of like pass through whatever's in the cytoplasm of one cell gets into the cytoplasm of the next cell. So that's going to be what happens with our cardiac cells later. Uh, I think I liked this video, so we're going to go watch a, I think a paramedic explain some of this stuff. Now, we're going to discuss cardiac induction as important. This is a deeper dive into the biomechanical and electromechanical action of this incredible organ called the heart. So now let's take a closer look at the heart and how it functions as a circulatory muscle. You see, the myocardium is the muscle that, unlike any other muscle within the human body, it's unique in that it can generate its own electrical impulse, known as autophagy. A special part of the heart, located in the superior aspect of the right atrium, called the sinoatrial nerve, or the SA nerve for short, works like an internal dynamic basemaker. This internal basemaker, when it comes towards the center, generates an electrical impulse that travels through the myocardium in a very organized and delivered fashion. You see, this FAO generates an electrical impulse at about a rate of 60 to 100 times per minute. Now, let's follow that pathway of the electrical impulse from the SAO to where it terminates and ends up in the fire. So, after the SAO initiates that electrical impulse, that impulse is a pathway called the internodal pathway. These travel throughout the right and the left atria. And then depolarize with the myocardial cell, which causes the actual muscle in the atrium to contract. From the atria, the electrical impulse travels along the pathway to the atrial ventricular or AV node, where it may be delayed strategically before it moves through the bundle disc and ultimately to the hidden fibers, which travel down through and wraps around the ventricles, completing the electromechanical cycle. Of a complete heart. The delay in the AV notes, which is located in the left mode of the whole atrium, is a necessary process in order to allow the ventricle to feed independently of each other and thereby they complete as a result of the function. For whatever reason, the AV notes do not complete as the primary impulse generator of feedback. The AV node then can begin sending its own electrical impulse instead. Though the AV node can vary its own impulse, it does so at a slower pace, which ranges between 40 and 60 impulses per minute. The impulse generated from the AV node then travels through the bundle of this, which is the route that the impulse travels to reach the pertaining fiber, which wrap around those ventricles we talked about earlier. This ventricle contraction then circulates the majority of the oxygen blood throughout the body. The bundle of this is the route of electrical transmission which travels between the atria and the ventricle. Now, after the impulse reaches the bundle of this, it travels down the width of the interventricular septum and leads to the left and right bundle branch, of which the left bundle branch has two fascicles because the left ventricle is larger than the right ventricle. These bundle branches terminate into the hinge fibers which depolarize the ventricular cells and cause the ventricular muscles to contract. In the case that both the SA and the AV nodes do not generate electrical impulses properly, the Purkinje fibers, which are located within the ventricles, then become the primary pacemaker source, which only generates electrical impulses in a range of around 15 to 40 feet per minute. Usually, this is too slow to produce the adequate south blood pressure or oxygenate cells within the body. So back to our slides. The order of contraction that we saw happening there, I liked watching it move, right? We were seeing the blood pump. So what we were seeing was that those atria, both the right and left atrium, up at the top of the cell, the heart, were contracting first. Right? So we have our heart, our atria are up at the top. So these contract first, okay? And they're coordinated, they go, 
and contract at the same time because the muscle cells themselves have gap junctions between them. So they get all the same signal. And we have those conduction fibers spreading apart. Okay, so the conduction fiber is spreading out from the SA node and ultimately to the AB node. Okay. They're able to resist the pressure of blood kind of as, as we're squeezing because they have another type of connection between them as well, something called a desmosome. Um, so desmosomes, probably not a word I'm going to test you on, but just so you know, this is kind of like a mechanical type of junction between cells. Have you, did you guys cover cell junctions in your prerequisites on that? Richard? Can anyone say yes or no? Have you heard of a desmosome before? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, then you know what desmosomes are. Okay, so they're resisting that mechanical stress. So we have gap junctions and these desmosomes uh, in these locations called intercalated discs between our cells. So this is just like a picture of what those cells would look like. So we see our SA node. So that would be like with the pacemaker cells. And then we see the actual muscle cells of the cardiac muscle here. So here we see those intercalated discs. And we see those action potentials going across through these cells. And then when we've zoomed in, we see the desmosomes. So strongly holding these together, providing like physical support. And we see the gap junctions where that electrical impulse can just like go straight through. All right. So in terms of the order that we're traveling along this electrical pathway, uh, the action potential, that's what AP here is, is initiated. So it's starting at the SA node, the sinoatrial node, and then it spreads out through the atria in the muscle through these interatrial pathways. And then through the internodal pathway, it gets to the AV node. This process is a little bit slow, creating something called an AV nodal delay so that we can have this kind of like one, two beat. Okay. From the AV node, we then go into the atrioventricular bundle, which is also called the bundle of Hiss, which then splits in half into a left bundle branch and a right bundle branch. And then we're gonna wrap around into our Purkinje fibers, which is gonna let us squeeze the ventricles like a tube of toothpaste from the bottom. So we'll take a look at that here. So first we got our SA node. So we can see that SA node is up here. So we can see it's kind of at the base of the superior vena cava up here in the right atrium. Okay. So from the SA node, we're moving out. So we can see those internodal pathways get us down to our atrioventricular node right here, right before we get into the ventricles. Okay. And we can see that there are also pathways going out to the left atrium, interatrial pathways, so that the left and right atrium squeeze together roughly around the same time. So we've gone from the SA node, internodal pathways to the AV node. So now we're gonna split out and send fibers around the right ventricle, and around the left ventricle. So before they split this little bit, that's the AV bundle, the atrioventricular bundle, the bundle of Hiss. And then after they split, we're calling them right and left bundle branches. Just for organization, right? In this picture, the right is over here, the left is over here. So this is our right bundle branch, and this is our left bundle branch. <coughs> Next, our Purkinje fibers are what's kind of wrapping us around and into the muscle. So as we loop back up, we're thinking about Purkinje fibers like this, and we can see them branching into the muscle as well. Other Purkinje fibers going around like that. Um, I'm gonna go ahead there and just like trace this whole line in. Okay. So overall, our pulse has gone from from the SA node through the internodal pathways to the AV node through the bundle of Hiss, splits out into our right and left bundle branches, goes to the bottom. All right, 
and then we loop around with our Purkinje fibers. So when I say that we're, we want to squeeze like toothpaste, we're going to be like, that has to do with this wrapping around bit, right? We're going to want to be like squeezing from the bottom because our ultimate goal is to make the blood go out through the pulmonary trunk to the lungs and through the aorta out to the body, right? So if we started squeezing up here at the top of the ventricle, that would be a problem because we'd be kind of forcing blood back down towards the apex of the heart, which is what we call this bottom pointy part. So that's why those Purkinje fibers have to wrap around from the bottom so that we can squeeze from the bottom of the heart. Push back up. Okay. So our pacemakers have autorhythmic cells, okay, which just have these automatic pacemaker potentials. Um, and they have spontaneous depolarization. So a depolarization we've learned is when our membrane potential goes up, right? So it's a change in that membrane potential of our cell. And the reason these depolarizations are happening, they're happening automatically, but they're still happening because of ion channels. So what's happening spontaneously is that we have sodium and potassium channels opening and causing net depolarization. Okay, so we know sodium wants to go into cells based on our usual concentrations, right? So we know that sodium, when it goes into a cell, rushes in, right, causing depolarization. So it's really the sodium is overpowering any leakage of potassium here, right? So that's kind of like our neurons. But what we have that's a little different from when we talked about action potentials in our neurons is our calcium channels are important in a different way. So our calcium channels in our cardiac cells are actually depolarizing the cells themselves. So we'll take a, a look at how that links up with these action potentials. But we're thinking sodium and calcium rush into the cell, right? Potassium still wants to move out. So the direction of ion movement here is the same as it's been for our other types of cells. All right, to depolarize to the threshold, we're really focusing on that calcium if we're in a cardiac cell rather than a neuron, okay? Then when we repolarize, like with the neurons, we're focusing on potassium channels. So we're gonna map that out. Right. So here we are looking at the electrical activity in a pacemaker cell specifically. Okay, so we're looking at the action potential in the pacemaker cell. So the action potential still refers to the fact that we have this peak, right? This peak of membrane potential. So our peak membrane potential happening here is our action potential. So we're gonna see that our pacemaker potential at the beginning is this automatic but slow depolarization, okay? So we see this slow depolarization first. Then we see a more rapid depolarization happening getting to that peak of the action potential. Then we repolarize, go below our threshold, and then it starts all over again. So what this is showing us are those sections of the changes in membrane potential. Okay. At the bottom, what we're seeing is how this links up with the permeability, that's what the P is. P here equals permeability. And this is a figure from your textbook. Mm -hmm. right. So we're talking about the permeability of the membrane to these different ions, right? So remember our membrane is more permeable to an ion if more channels for that ion are open, right? So this is really telling you about the state of those ion channels. So we can see during this first section, during this first part of that slow depolarization in the pacemaker potential, we have our permeability of sodium increasing, part of the rise here, and we also have our permeability of potassium decreasing a little bit. So we're letting sodium flow into the cell and some potassium may still be flowing out, but less is flowing out than it was before. And so that's that first part of the rise. 
than the second part. Now we see that calcium is kind of starting to take over. So the permeability of calcium is increasing. Calcium wants to go into a cell, right? In our neurons, that calcium triggered neurotransmitter release. In our skeletal muscle cells, that calcium was helping us start the cross bridge cycle. Now in the heart, that calcium is helping us create an action potential in our conduction cells. So the calcium is increasing and we're kind of turning off the sodium signal. So the permeability of sodium is decreasing here. So our neuron action potential was really, really tied to sodium. In the heart, really calcium is more important, although sodium is still involved. All right, so that second bit in yellow is describing what's happening here. Okay. So we have calcium permeability increasing, calcium coming into the cell, permeability of the sodium decreasing a little bit. The spike of the action potential here is increased by a big increase in the permeability of calcium specifically. So this is calcium basically. Okay. That big rise, that action potential is because we have a lot of calcium ions come into the cell. Then the repolarization, we're turning off that calcium permeability and we're letting potassium escape out of the cell so that we can repolarize. So during this next whole bit block, we see the permeability of calcium decreasing and the permeability of potassium increasing. So that's the gist of what's happening here. Now, that was a pacemaker cell, right? So that was a pacemaker cell, one of these electrical pathway cells. Um, but we also have our contractile cells. So the ones physically contracting, the ones that have sarcomeres, so that's like cardiac muscle, right? So we have phases of electrical activity in the contractile cells as well. Uh, so this is similar, but the graph is going to look a little different. So for the phases of the activity in the contractile cells, we go zero to four, count phase zero to phase four. Okay. So first, we're increasing the permeability to sodium. So sodium is going to come into the cell. Then in phase one, sodium permeability decreasing a little bit. So that's kind of slowing down. Phase two, we're increasing the permeability to calcium. We're decreasing the permeability to potassium a bit. And phase three, we're increasing the permeability to potassium and decreasing the permeability to calcium as we start to come back down to get to our resting membrane potential. And we'll take a look at this in a picture in a sec. So the duration here is like 250 to 300 milliseconds for a cardiac contractile cell. So here's what we see happening with those ions and with our membrane potential. So we're looking at over time, changes to our membrane potential in a contractile cell in the heart. So we're gonna start at rest and end at rest, which is phase four, okay? So phase zero for our contractile cell here, we're increasing the permeability to sodium. Okay. That was why I was emphasizing to you that this is a contractile cell versus our previous graph, which was our pacemaker cells. That's why they're not the same. Um, so this is the muscle cell. That was like a cell in the SA node or something like that. Okay. So here it is sodium. Then we're decreasing that permeability to sodium. Here we have this plateau, it's flattening out a little because of that calcium. Okay. Then we're repolarizing back to rest. So we are going to couple together uh, the excitation, right? So the electrical activity to contraction in our cardiac contractile cells. So this is gonna be a little similar to what we did with our skeletal muscle. So we're still gonna have T tubules. Um, there's still gonna be calcium and a sarcoplasmic reticulum. 
there's still going to be troponin and tropomyosin. Um, but some of the things that we're going to see are going to be a little bit different uh, from what we saw in our skeletal muscle and more similar to smooth muscle, which we did kind of blitz through. Um, but some of those properties that we're going to see are going to be that we have gap junctions, right? Cardiac muscle and smooth muscle both have gap junctions, which we don't see in skeletal muscle. Um, and here, we're going to see some extracellular calcium involved. When we talked about skeletal muscle, that calcium was really coming from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now some of it is coming from outside the cell. Okay. So when we're looking at this contraction, all right, so we can still see like a cross bridge cycle thing going down here, right? So we're trying to trigger that. So what's happening in our cell is we're first getting our depolarizing current, right? Like, so like the action potential-ish, right? Coming in through a gap junction, okay? So this is coming either from another contractile cell or from an autorhythmic cell, like a pacemaker cell, right? Depending where exactly we are. So we're getting this depolarization coming in, okay? And then that action potential travels. So that action potential is traveling along the membrane, right? So traveling along the membrane. And it's also eventually gonna go down a T-tubule, right? So the T-tubule, those transverse tubules diving down into the cell, right? So we can see that whole thing kind of going along. As this is going on, this action potential is triggering calcium channels to open. So we're getting calcium into our cell, because that calcium is going to be important for our cross bridge cycle. So here we can see that some of those calcium channels are in this external membrane, so in the plasma membrane of our cardiac cell. So this is that extracellular calcium bit that we didn't see in skeletal muscle. So some of that calcium is coming from outside, okay? but some of that calcium is coming from inside the cell like we did see in skeletal muscle. So some of that calcium is coming from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So the difference here is just now that we have two sources for that calcium. Cool. Then the calcium was being released from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Where's the number four? Okay, yeah, so the extracellular calcium here does partially trigger the sarcoplasmic calcium release, but we can put those all as one. We're just focus on the calcium. Okay. So the calcium, is binding to the troponin, that little pink snowman thing. Troponin shifts our tropomyosin to the side, exposing that myosin binding site. Or that, yeah, exposing the myosin binding site so we can bind to the actin, okay? And then our cross bridge cycle is beginning. So cross bridge cycle is six, so that's our loop, okay? And then our calcium is getting actively transported back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum so that we can essentially like recycle it. And some of it is getting shifted out of the cell. Okay? And then the muscle fiber relaxes as that tropomyosin goes and blocks back over those myosin binding cells. So this should be really similar to what we saw when we were doing skeletal muscle. So if we're tagging our differences, right, the difference is that we have a gap junction instead of a neuromuscular junction. And we have some extracellular calcium instead of like pretty much all of it coming from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And those are the main differences I see. Okay. So where this is coming from and sorry, where the action potential is coming from and where the calcium is coming from are two main differences here really. Depolarizing current coming through, that's our action potential. Then we see that action potential traveling down the membrane and down the T-tubules, triggering calcium to come in, part of it coming from the extracellular fluid, part of it coming from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Calcium binding to the troponin, exposing those myosin binding sites. So then our cross bridge cycle is beginning. So our fiber is contracting. And then we're getting rid of the calcium. So that's happening here. Once we get rid of the calcium, we relax. So 
when we relax that cardiac muscle, we're removing calcium from the cytosol. When we're talking about skeletal muscle relaxing, we're pulling that uh, calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. That is one thing that we do here. But in our cardiac muscle, we are also getting rid of some of that calcium and actively pumping that into our extracellular fluid. So when we're thinking about electrical activity, often we'll think about like recording the electrical activity, trying to figure out what's going on with yourself, a family member, a patient, by measuring things on the outside of the body. Right? We're not physically cutting someone open just to look at their heart. So you can record some of these changes in membrane potential, some of these changes in electrical activity by carefully placing electrodes on the skin. So this is non-invasive, great. Um, and we can use this to test for different abnormalities. So the reason, the way we do this is with something called an electrocardiogram, okay? So our electrocardium ECG is going to be measuring external electrical activity um, by measuring the outside of the body, trying to kind of back solve what's going on with the heart. We can do this because the body works as a decent conductor because you are full of water. Um, so the currents in the body can spread to the surface. How far you are um, from the heart does kind of change the signal a little bit. So the size of the electrical potential in the heart makes a difference and the synchronicity of potentials from other cells makes a difference for how we measure it, but we don't need to get into the exact details of that. Overall, we should see synchronization in the heart's electrical activity though. We're gonna look at the practical part, okay. So when you're recording an electrocardiogram, ECG or EKG, I think the K1 is just when they're using like a German word or something, um, we're gonna see something like this, right? So here's our electrocardiogram. You'll notice now, it's in millivolts, right? So it's in millivolts, just like our membrane potentials were. Right? So this is recording electrical activity. Here's the actual membrane potential above. So this is what we saw in those contractile cells, right? So that's what we were just tracking with that like phase zero, one, two, three, four, right? So this is what would be going on in the heart, but this is what we're going to be recording from the outside of the body below, right? So you can see they're not the same, but you can use them to kind of interpret what's happening. Okay. So we name the different parts of this wave uh, to try and test what's going on in the heart. So when we're looking at this peak, maybe I can try and draw it bigger. Okay. So first thing we see here is our P wave. All right, so the P is this part. And then we have this QRS complex, which is referring to this first dip, Q, and then this sharp peak, R, and then this S part. All right, so this is the QRS complex. And then we have a final T wave. And then we reset. Okay, so if it looks like this, that's normal, everything's good. If there are shifts to this, there can be shifts, but that means that there's a shift to something in the electrical activity of the heart. So these can all be mapped on to where they should be, and you can measure which one's missing, which one's too far, what's going on. Okay. So what these correspond to in terms of like what's happening in your heart, the P wave, this first little peak, okay, this is talking about what's happening in your atria, right? Oh, we have our little heart. Right. right atrium, left atrium, obviously not to scale, right ventricle, left ventricle. Okay. So the P wave is when our atria up at the top should be depolarizing. P should tell you atria depolarizing. The QRS complex is telling you about the ventricles squeezing. Actually, I'll do that P, right? And then QRS. So a lot is going on during QRS, right? We have three parts, but we 
often just talk about it as a complex, so as these three pieces together. So it's happening there. So we've already squeezed the atria, right? Kind of that's what was going on with the P. So now those atria are repolarizing, right? So they're going back to their normal state. And now the ventricles are depolarizing, right? So the signal, the electrical signal has gotten to the ventricles. And that's what we're seeing here in this QRS complex. Okay. So that's gonna be the trigger. This QRS piece is the trigger for contraction of the ventricles. Those ventricles then need to repolarize and that's the T. So those are like the, the three pieces mapping onto our electrical conductivity. So P wave, depolarizing the atria, QRS, ventricles are now depolarizing and the atria are basically resetting, right? The T, the ventricles are resetting, they're repolarizing. Those are the three pieces. And then things we might measure, right? So things we might measure separately, right? You might measure the distance between P and Q, right? So we said that there's a little bit of a delay between the time that the sinoatrial node tells the atria to contract before we get that signal to the AV node and then spread it out to the ventricles. That's our AV nodal delay, right? That delay between the atria and the ventricles. So we could measure how long that delay is by measuring P to Q, okay? Other things we can look at here. Um, so we're gonna talk about systole and diastole later. So we're thinking about when the heart and specifically really when the ventricles are squeezing versus when they're relaxing. So we can do that by measuring Q to T, right? So that's like the initiation of that ventricular depolarization to the end when our ventricles are repolarizing. So that would be our ventricular systole. Then our ventricular diastole, we could measure from the T all the way to the following Q, it's gonna be our ventricular diastole. So I like to think of like, systole stress squeezing, but we'll talk about that. Okay. So this is kind of why we care about like thinking about these pathways and thinking about what's going on in the heart so that when we're looking at a recording like this, we can use it to pair our knowledge of what, what we see on a screen with what's happening inside someone's body. So we're gonna briefly intro the cardiac cycle so when we talk about the cardiac cycle think about like listening to a heartbeat right you hear that like dup, 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 dup thing right that's because things in the heart happen in an order right the blood flow travels in an order the electrical signal passes through in an order and we're going to see that pressures in the heart are changing in an order changing the states of different valves. So when we say the cycle, what we're talking about is like a whole round of what has to happen as you do like a single heartbeat, basically. So we're gonna be thinking a lot about pressure. So we're gonna be thinking about pressure in the atria and pressure in the ventricles. We're also going to be thinking about pressure in the aorta specifically, because that pressure is really, uh, what controls whether blood leaves your heart, right? Because where it's leaving to go to the body is through the aorta. Um, and that pressure in the aorta is also going to be the pressure that squeezes blood out to everywhere else in your body. So that's kind of like the shower pressure, right? For your body is the pressure in the aorta. Okay, so pressures are going to be important. And when we think about pressures, when we talk about pressure gradients or whatever, we're still just thinking about the very simple, we're going to go from high pressure to low pressure, that's the direction that our fluids are gonna travel, okay? Pressure is related to volume. If you have more stuff in a smaller space, it's gonna be at higher pressure. If you have a big space and not much stuff, kind of relaxed, it's gonna be at a lower pressure. And eventually we're gonna link this up with the sounds you can actually hear in the heart. All right, so we're tracking just a single complete heartbeat. And there are going to be two main periods of a cardiac cycle. So when we are thinking about a cardiac cycle, we're often like very focused on the ventricles 
because that's what's pumping blood out specifically to the body, right? So like really the most important thing kind of to us is what's happening in the left ventricle as we're pumping out into the aorta, into the rest of the body. Everything else is important, but it's mainly important because it's controlling, is blood getting to your tissue? Is it leaving the heart when it should? Um, so saying that to you because different parts of our heart contract at different times, right? You've just said the atria contract first and then the ventricles. So when we describe systole and diastole as contraction and relaxation, I just want to point out to you that specifically we're talking about ventricles. Okay. So systole refers to ventricular contraction. So systole is when you're squeezing the ventricles and squeezing blood out to the body. So systole, contraction of the ventricles. Diastole is gonna be relaxation. And again, because we're biased and we are worried about is blood getting to tissue, we're thinking about ventricle here. So systole squeezing, diastole, I can't think of a word for relaxing that starts with a D, so it's just the other one, okay? So those are our two main periods of the cardiac cycle, but we're gonna track a lot more than just that, right? So these two pieces, the contraction and the relaxation, are gonna have effects on valves, they're gonna have effects on pressure in blood vessels as well as the atria, um, and we're going to need to tack on kind of all that information. So we're going to end up with a couple more phases than just these two, but these are the big ones. Um, like if you've ever taken a blood pressure, right, they give you two numbers. You have a systolic and a diastolic blood pressure because it's referring to, okay, what's your blood pressure when the heart is just squeezing out blood? What's your blood pressure when the heart's relaxed, right? So Ultimately, we often track down to these two separations. So we're going to be caring a bunch about pressure, whether your ventricles or your atria are contracting and squeezing, that's going to affect the pressure because if we make our container smaller with stuff inside, it's going to be under higher pressure. The valves in the heart also respond to pressure. So this is where we are going to pay a bit more attention to the names of those valves. Okay, so here's our heart. I'll draw it a little better than usual. So I'm going to draw, uh, yeah, so I'll draw a solid line down the center. So we're still separating our right from our left. This time I'm going to put on our AV valves. Right, so we have our right AV valve, and our left AV valve. So this first one, actually, so these are atria on the top. These are ventricles on the bottom. All right, so to name any space, you go right atria, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle, like that, okay? So these are both AV valves because they're between an atrium and a ventricle. So you can refer to right AV valve, left AV valve, or we can add on a sort of anatomical description. The right one has three cusps, so it's your tricuspid valve. The left one has two cusps, so it's your bicuspid valve. So these valves open in response to pressure, okay? So I've drawn them curving down like this actually for a reason, right? Like I would never draw these little lines curving up unless I'm trying to tell you that someone has a heart defect. The reason for that is that these valves open when we have high pressure in an atrium, pushing them open down into a ventricle. That's how they work. That's the direction they should open, okay? So that's why when I draw them open, I always draw them with these little curves down because that's the direction they go. High pressure here opens them up to low pressure here. So if they are open, this is what's happening with those pressures. If I do ever draw a heart, right, like, that, right, like I'm telling you blood is blowing back into the atrium where it shouldn't be, right? That That is an actual heart problem, okay? That shouldn't happen. All right, 
Our semilunar valves open when ventricular pressure is greater than arterial pressure. Uh, so that's not in this drawing, but let's think a little bit about a semilunar valve and then I'll pick up here next time. Okay, so I'm gonna just draw an aorta from the left side of the heart because I think that's easiest. Okay, so right. We have an AV valve over here. We have a left AV valve over here. Close that atrium. I'm gonna give you the aorta like here. Okay. Okay, so our semi-lunar valves, the way they're they are arranged is they're just like in the wall of a blood vessel. And I'm always gonna draw them for you like this, right? Something like that. Okay. And the way they work, right? The direction of those little curves is important here too. Because what happens is that when blood flows through them like this, they collapse against the walls, right? So when we have high pressure in a ventricle and low pressure over in our aorta here, what happens to these little orange things is we're pushing on this little bag and it'll like flatten like that, right? Make this door wider, right? So high pressure in a ventricle, and it's higher than in the artery, pushes those valves against the walls of the artery, and that is their open state. Their job, do a lot of racing here. Right. So in their open state, right, they're pushed against the wall. So you just have a free flowing artery, your blood can get out there. In their closed state is when they're like little bags and they actually do touch each other in the center like this. And what they're doing is they're preventing blood from going back, right? So as blood tries to flow back, like if there's high pressure in the aorta, it would try to go back, but these open up like like a sail kind of, right? So they catch on the edges of those semi-lunar valves and fill them up with blood. And then they bounce open and close shut. And this is what prevents blood from going back into the heart instead of out to the rest of the body. Okay. So we'll do cardiac cycle stuff when I see you on Monday, but otherwise have a great weekend.